Hi, I'm Walter Leitch. I'm the PI of the Virtual Learning Lab. Um, today, I'm, I will be presenting the work we have done in the Virtual Learning Lab over the last five years uh, together with my co-PIs. So what's the Virtual Learning Lab? It is a research and development center funded by the Institution, Institute of Education Sciences. Um, it was started by Carol Bill, and, and then um, I took over in 2018. Um, we do research related to precision education. You can find more information about the Virtual Learning Lab in www.virtuallearninglab.org. So this is um, our team, uh, the co-PIs and some key collaborators. Uh, we come from, from uh, different institutions and you'll hear from some of them today. So uh, the Virtual Learning Lab worked uh, to improve precision education methodology using Algebra Nation as a platform. Algebra Nation is a, a virtual learning environment that's part of Math Nation and includes quizzes um, for students, videos, and um, an adaptive remediation tool um, for students and also tools for teachers, such as a homework creation tool and uh, reports of student activity. And you have here on the screen uh, an example of how algebra nation looks like. So procedural education, which is the focus of the virtual learning lab, um, this is a definition that we use in this grant. Um, which is to provide learning resource recommendations and personalized content sequencing to meet individual stu student needs. And I will show you uh, in this presentation um, what we did and some of the challenges we encountered. Okay, so this is a timeline. Uh, we started in 2016, 2017, collect system logs um, and teacher surveys to really understand how students and teachers were using algebra nation. In 2017, Sidney um, and, and his team worked on a fact detection measure, and, and I did some analysis of uh, how um, algebra nation affects student achievement. Then um, in the next year, we did, um, Corinne Manley um, did psychometric analysis with her team and uh, of the items in algebra nation and they developed the first recommendation system. Uh, did a field study of that system then develop a second recommendation system uh, and, and did a second field study right when uh, the COVID pandemic started. And, and then we, this year we finished a, a third field study with, which is a replication of the, the second recommendation system, okay? Now, so the, the first recommendation system aimed at showing in, um, video recommendations for students after they completed quizzes in Algebra Nation. These video recommendations are not, they work more like nudges because the students could easily dismiss them. They, they showed as a, a screen on top of uh, Algebra Nation. They could minimize the screen. And um, they were developed based on Markov decision process. And, um, it showed, you know, for students, sometimes they took the recommendations, sometimes they ignored it. In the first study, we had a large sample, uh, 16,406 middle and high school students receive uh, the recommendation. They, uh, teachers were not aware that the uh, students were participating in the study. Uh, students were not aware if they were in the treated or, or control condition, so it was blind to them. Um, and we looked at um, high, the effect of receiving recommendation on high stakes tests, the algebra EOC scores, which is required in Florida. Um, we found that there was no average treatment effect, but for students that completed a large number of quizzes, there was a difference. So there was an interaction here with the number of quizzes. Um, this showed us a, a couple of issues, one that, um, that because algebra nation is used under the guidance of the teacher, 
students were uh, not likely to click on the recommendation during classes if the teacher had a, a, already another activity for them. So um, we realized that it was important to keep the teacher in the loop. Uh, and also um, we realized that it would be important to improve this system because this system didn't account for student engagement. It didn't, um, and it was also very more demanding in terms of data and, um, and students you know, were not taking recommendations very frequently. So the next year, we did a second recommendation system where now we used uh, the student engagement detection system developed by CIMDI's team, and we also used um, ability estimation system uh, combined with machine learning that was developed under the leadership of Corinne Manley. Um, and we integrated both things uh, under the, 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 the framework of providing a video that would be within the student's zone of proximal development. Um, and the, the video, so the video would be at appropriate level of challenge. Um, and we created different levels of videos depending on whether the student, the level of engagement of the students. So this was a, a major improvement over the first system. Um, but again, you know, light touch student can still ignore the video. Uh, although this time we recruited teachers so the teacher to participate. So the teachers uh, were aware that we were doing this study uh, and they were aware of the recommendation systems, but they, they were still blind to whether students were receiving treatment or control because, they, you know, both treatment and control were receiving a recommendation, except that the recommendation for the control group wasn't, uh, was just the next video in the sequence. Um, so, now, in this, when we did the second field study, uh, we had a large sample of study uh, of students. And we started this study February 3rd, uh, 2020. Um, we're running it until March 17th. And then the COVID pandemic happened, the schools in Florida closed and instruction moved online, but we were allowed to continue this study. So we have two periods before schools closed and after schools closed. We found a significant uh, effect before schools closed, but the effect disappeared after schools closed. This is going to be presented uh, next, uh, this year at the uh, meeting, the International Conference on Learning Analytics and Knowledge, LAC, at 2022. Okay, so the third field study uh, was spring 2021, and we, did pretty much the same recommendation system, just some tuning and found a significant treatment effect on the post-test, but no effect on algebra one ALC scores. Algebra one ALC scores is a, is a distal outcome. So it's like the performance on high stakes testing. Um, and it shows the potential for this in, in, in non-intrusive machine learning based interventions to improve student achievement. Um, so this is, um, an overview of the of um, the study. And now my my copy eyes will um, drill on more specific parts of of the research that we did at the virtual learning lab. But you can find a complete list of um, publications and contacts of all team members at uh, virtuallearninglab.org. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Um, this is Sydney DeMello from the University of Colorado Boulder, and I want to build on one component of what Walter just uh, spoke to us about. Um, uh, experiments with measuring engagement uh, at scale uh, with the virtual learning lab. So let me just start with a few preliminaries. Um, what is engagement uh, in the context of learning? Uh, it's uh, a complicated construct to define, though it's widely accepted that it has uh, a behavioral, it's multi-componential, a behavioral, cognitive, and affective component. Uh, there's also other components proposed, such as an agentic engagement uh, with students at agency. 
engagement unfolds over time and across contexts. Uh, it's it's not a one-off thing. Uh, on one on one hand, uh, this is um, a framework of uh, Sinatra and colleagues. To, uh, in one hand, you think about engagement as this person-oriented. This is a person in the context of learning, um, where these affective, cognitive, and behavioral patterns unfold. Um, you can even think about the whole structures of our educational system, uh, how those put constraints that support uh, or hinder engagement. This could be, um, you know, policies and things like that. We think about that as the context-oriented uh, perspective of engagement. And somewhere in the middle is the person in a context, the student in a classroom with one teacher or another teacher, algebra or geometry, uh, and so on and so forth. So, so the work I'm going to talk about today is really looking at a more of a micro perspective of engagement oriented in the person, in the person oriented. So very fine-grained measurements. However, we do look, as I'll elaborate, at multiple contexts. So sometimes it's a person uh, in different in, in, at home, in schools, and so on. So there are contextual influences. Uh, engagement can be measured uh, using multiple methods. Uh, these could be um, uh, self-reports, uh, as traditionally done, um, you know, uh, observational methods, uh, typically done in research studies, and behavioral measures. So um, how you can measure engagement based on student behaviors. These could be, uh, in, in the case of online learning, uh, how they're clicking, um, as well as you can look at eye tracking. So, uh, so there's a range of ways to measure engagement. Engagement uh, measurement can be automated. Uh, you can use uh, all kinds of sensors, uh, such as the eye tracker on the top, facial expressions, body movements. And on the left, you see kind of almost a recipe um, of how you may develop automatic measures of engagement. But what these typically do is they uh, learn how to use machine learning to make some inference um, on uh, some sense data with some labels of engagement through self-reports or observers. This is very much similar to what we've done here. And uh, when you have an automatic measure, you can do things with it. Uh, here's an example of uh, an attention-aware tutoring system uh, we developed uh, that looks at uh, engagement based on eye tracking and intervenes dynamically. Here's another approach. It doesn't always have to be on the students' uh, direct intervention to students. You can inform teachers. This is the student engagement analytics technology that looks at uh, facial expressions and also context and gives teachers feedback. Uh, when students are learning, as you can see in the right, in a more virtual learning context, uh, learning one-on-one -on -one with digital technology. We blended these ideas in the current project, uh, and I want to talk to you about sensor free engagement, measurement, and algebra nation. Both those previous examples used a lot of sensing. They worked on, you know, very small classes. They didn't scale. So the, what was exciting about this project was to take these ideas and scale them up. So uh, to do that, because uh, algebra nation uh, or math nation, as you know, is, is, uh, is a virtual learning environment, and we wanted to study it in large samples of students, it was infeasible to put sensors on. So we looked at sensor-free measure. How do patterns of interaction with the application itself tell us something about their levels of engagement? So uh, I wanted to distinguish our previous work from our current work uh, and why the VLL uh, gave us an opportunity to really push the boundaries. Most of the work is focused on very few emotional states. These are measures, like they look at things of engagement, like, um, uh, contentness, curiosity, interest, confusion, frustration. We looked at a large set because we did have the scale of numbers. Usually people uh, develop the algorithms, their machine learning algorithms to infer engagement from a few thousand cases, some hundreds of students. Our models were based on a large number of cases from almost 70,000 students. So there's a lot of variability packed in there. Uh, usually people look at a few days, a few weeks. Uh, here we've looked at an entire school year. And when I say usually, I'm countering also my previous work. Um, so just this is just a new opportunity to really expand things. Uh, many times, we because we have small data, we uh, tend to over uh, engineer the models for the data. So we may encode things like, this is your engagement is seven on a scale of one to 10 when watching video, video eight, and that's packaged into the model. We wanted to look beyond that and said, let's just encode things more generally. How many videos have they watched? How many questions have they answered? How many times have they hit the pause button? So these, ideally, our models should generalize more broadly. Uh, and again, previous work has been restricted to a few classrooms or the lab. Here we have many contexts, home, classroom, study hall. So there's this lot of heterogeneity in the data, which makes the problem challenging, but also interesting. And lastly, um, again, people typically don't look at domain generalizability. Here we actually looked at models in algebra as well as geometry. So can the model train in algebra generalize to geometry and so on and so forth. So, um, our first work 
um, looked at uh, uh, the first finding was that a model uh, of student engagement that looked at clickstream patterns, um, pauses, plays, rewinds, forwards, a set of about 18 or 25 actions, um, were able, was able to measure engagement uh, de defined as 18 different uh, emotional and cognitive states with a mean accuracy of about 0.25. This is a correlation between the model's estimate and student self-reports of engagement collected as they're interacting with the learning technology. So as students are interacting with algebra nation, here's an example of a video. At certain events, we would ask them uh, to self-report in the engagement. Uh, this is called ec ecologically moment momentary assessment or, or experience sampling. And then we would look at the uh, action sequences uh, uh, three minutes to five minutes before the uh, self-report and use that to um, try to predict the self-report and do this in a way that's trained in a generalizable way. So this, these results we think are decent um, given that we're looking at very, very basic behaviors to measure a rather complex construct um, in uh, a very unrestricted and with large samples. This model is embedded in the recommendation system that uh, Walter just spoke to you about. So uh, the idea is to base the recommend recommendation on student prior knowledge as well as the engagement. Um, since then, we've done a couple of other things. Um, instead of just focusing on affective engagement as the previous case, we've also developed a model of cognitive engagement. So as students uh, navigate the Algebra Nation platform, they have the option of taking these mini quizzes. These are uh, uh, three item quizzes on a particular topic. So they may watch a video and take the quiz. So we said, can we actually predict the quiz scores based on five minutes of activity prior to the quiz? This would be anything. It could be taking a previous quiz, um, they could have on a different topic. They could be watching videos. They could be posting to the wall. And it turns out that that actually uh, doubled the accuracy. So looking at these data and predicting something as concrete as a quiz score, uh, we could actually get correlations of about 0.53 by combining behavioral data and prior knowledge using uh, models, uh, an IoT model that my colleague Karen developed and you'll hear about next. Um, so here's an example of the self-reported quiz scores with the model predictions. But then we said more recently, what if we just looked at video watching only? What is the information in a video? So if I just watch a video, can I look at the information in a video to predict whether or not students will answer a quiz correctly based on that video? And we looked at sequences of actions. So you can think about uh, the main actions being plays, play, pausing, and seeking over time. And we trained sequence uh, learning neural networks to predict um, the, 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 the score in these quizzes. And it turns out there's, and we can look at many ways, looking before the end of the video, towards the end, we, we played around with various variations of the sequence. But what's interesting is this, there was surprisingly little information in these video control actions. Uh, there's a signal there, but it's weak. So correlation of about 0.11. And that is comparable to what you achieve from an IRT model that just predicts the score in that quiz. Um, uh, and that gives you 0.14. However, combining those helped a bit, got you to about 0.2. So it's very interesting that uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of interest in mining these video sequences, but actually there's limited information for the, for the simple reason that uh, this behavioral signal itself, without understanding the underlying context, uh, has limited information. So, but this is um, what we're continuing to pursue. So the open question with all of this is: to what extent, you know, can these models improve the learning experience and outcomes? Measurement is one thing. What can you do with the measures is another story entirely. And which is why we've been excited to work with the, the VLL, uh, the virtual learning lab to embed, I think for the first time, engagement models in this recommender system. And that was a model of affective engagement. And in the future, we're looking to think of, do things about you know, using the model of cognitive engagement. You can imagine a situation where as a student is watching the video or interacting, it may proactively prompt them to take a quiz um, if they think that uh, they're ready to answer it um, and so on. The actual specifics of the intervention need to be worked out. So uh, thank you so much um, for your attention. Hi, I'm Danielle McNamara from Arizona State University. And I'm going to talk about language and the use of language and natural language processing in the virtual learning lab project. So uh, before I start, I want to acknowledge uh, three of my collaborators. Jenny Shin started as an extern in the project, and she's now joined uh, University of Florida faculty there. And Michelle Bonawan is a current uh, um, uh, postdoc, and Renu Balian was a postdoc with me, but she has joined faculty at SUNY. 
So um, uh, moving on uh, to talk about what is natural language processing. Um, people don't often think about natural language processing in the context of math, but uh, we use language when we're doing math and there's a lot of language between the students and also, of course, when the tutor and the teacher is providing instruction. There's language, and one of the goals of um, my end of the project has been to examine what we can do with the language and how we can use that language and leverage it in predicting the student success as well as what the tutor uh, is providing. So before uh, I start, what is natural language processing? It's the analysis of language, human language, using computers. And we do that in various ways. One of the things we do is analyze the linguistic features. And uh, we also analyze the words and use machine learning with that to provide predictive, uh, predictive algorithms. Our goal is to use the natural language and the natural language processing algorithms to better understand learning in the, these math environments and to derive insights uh, relevant uh, to the educational uh, context. So in this project, we came in, uh, our team came in a little bit late uh, in uh, the third year and uh, to analyze the language within these projects that you've been hearing about so far. One of them, one of our projects has been to analyze the tutoring, the lectures that are provided by the video experts. You might have heard, if you've been watching the other talks, you heard about the videos that the students watch. Well, those are provided by the tutors. And our one of our goals was just to understand the language provided in those video tutors, to, to understand the differences between them. And then moving forward, we're going to be able to use that language of those analyses and the natural language processing to um, support further projects with tutoring uh, when, with tutors. Um, the other project uh, has to do with, we ran a project where teachers, uh, tutors were provided uh, tutoring uh, online with students, one-on-one uh, -on -one tutoring dialogues. And we've been analyzing the language of the students and the tutors within that context. And then finally, as you well know, many of these, uh, uh, these learning tools have discussion boards and um, the math tutor here uh, does too. So we've been looking at the math wall discussion boards and what we can glean from the discussions between the students and between the students and, the, and their instructors. So I'm gonna uh, go through these projects and just briefly describe them. Uh, and uh, these projects include looking at the tutoring videos, as I said, uh, another study looking at the video lectures, and also a study looking at the online discussion boards, uh, a couple of studies on, on that. So I'm gonna briefly go through those and also point to some papers that we have um, written that can give you more information about these projects and more information about the kinds of analyses that we're doing. So the first one where we take these uh, tutoring videos, we transcribe them, and then we looked at the um, types of language that was were being used in the tutoring videos. One thing you might think about is the content that's being provided within these videos, but we were actually more interested in the communication component. How were these tutorings communicating within these contexts? And could we even identify the communication uh, moves between that differed between the differing uh, tutors? So um, we went at it uh, combining different theoretical frameworks and as well as machine learning analyses to look to see if we could identify these communication patterns. And so doing, we identified 17 discourse markers that were um, uh, 
correlated with the various tutoring experts patterns. And then also three general uh, pedagogical discourse use patterns. And one of the things that was very interesting it was in the looking at the differences between the different the different tutors was the differing amounts of interpersonal and structural discourse choices. And that gave us information about the different styles that the tutoring and the, the experts used within their instructional uh, videos. In the second study, we're looking at the same video lectures, but we took a different approach. In this study, we looked, we used Cometrics and Seance. Cometrics is a tool that looks at the linguistics of the uh, language. So it extracts uh, differing, different types of linguistics, but basic linguistics. Uh, such as the word choices, syntactic differences, and in particular cohesion. Uh, so when we're talking, we have different amounts of links between the ideas that we're expressing. And seance is another tool that we've developed that extracts um, emotional components of language. So you remember that Sydney uh, talked about emotion being extracted from the, uh, the behavioral components. So I'm expressing emotion both with my face and my hands, as well as the language and the words that I use. And so in this study, we're extracting uh, what we can from the words that the students are, uh, from the, the, that the uh, tutors are using. And this was very interesting because we discovered intentional language choices, uh, that they were very different patterns between the tutors and that those patterns differed in terms of the amount of information that this, the words conveyed, the ease of the language. So some of the tutors use more complex language than the others. Some of the tutors use more narrativities in their, in their uh, videos, whereas others were more informational. And then also another interesting component about it is the amount of link in terms of action. So um, the use of verbs and um, the kinds of things that we convey in terms of what, what to do and intentional verbs and the links between them. Those also differed between the, between the tutors. And then also, of course, there was underlying sentiment between these intentional language choices. And so uh, working further from there, we want to look at these language choices as well as the sentiment and the language patterns that we've identified using the uh, uh, previous study that I was talking about to uh, better understand tutoring in the lot. So uh, moving on to the wall post, as I mentioned, uh, many of the students are engaging in the discourse wall post. And so uh, in prior studies that uh, we've worked on, we found that the language that students use in discussion boards is a very uh, revealing of the kinds of skills that the students have. they not only their knowledge of math, but potentially, you know, their language sophistication, how well they can read, how well they can uh, communicate. And so our goal in this project has been to examine the extent to which we can extract information from these, uh, the wall posts, not only in terms of um, the nature of the language, but also, of course, in terms of their interactions, the interactions between the students. So again, in this project, we leveraged Cometrics um, to assess the linguistic features. So the underlying features of these, of the language that the students were using and the emotions behind it as well. We, in this project, we also had demographics from the students and their uh, end of year course performance data. Our approaches, we used several approaches. One has been using topic modeling, so extracting what are the students talking about, and then also uh, looking at the components, the linguistic features to see if there are uh, profiles of language use to, to uh, examine it. In, in essence, it's really a qualitative analysis 
We're extracting the language features and then looking at what kinds of profiles we see with uh, amongst these students. And we've seen that uh, the linguistics, and so the language that they use, uh, the ling linguistic sophistication is predicts end of year, uh, end of course algebra one scores, even over and above math skills and their demographics. Um, we know that prior skills um, account for a great deal of variance in the end of course algebra one scores. And what we've been examining is the extent to which we can use what the students are saying in the course to identify how well they will do at the end. Um, and, and of course, this is the, the main goal is to work towards stealth assessment. That is, if we can add to the algorithm, the predictive algorithm for course performance, using the language with, that the students are using, then our goal is to improve predictions at the end of the year. Another uh, aspect of this is we've been, uh, like I said, we are uh, looking at the principal components so uh, to develop a profile of the language that the students are using, both in terms uh, and what this reveals is that there are differences in language fluency and writing proficiency. Uh, and in the end, what our goal is to simply better understand the language, but then also these components can be used in future analyses to as latent predictors of the student's language. And then finally here, we did topic model, modeling analyses because one basic question that instructors have is what are the students talking about? Can you tell us what the students are talking about in the discussion boards? And so we've done topic, uh, topic modeling analyses to uh, extract what are the students uh, talking about? How much variance can we account for in the uh, topics that they are uh, talking about? And one of the things we've found is that a great deal of what they're talking about is task grant oriented and domain relevant. Some of it, of course, is communicative, but we can look at the different kinds of domains and tasks that they are um, talking about between themselves. And then another study that we've looked at is looking at the social interactions. So, um, so looking at the, um, uh, the discourse and discussion uh, discussions amongst them, we've identified three components. One is the content, content interaction, so the cognitive aspects of, of their discussions. Another is social interaction. So in these discussion boards, they are interacting with one another and a large part of that is social. And the third part is supportive. So um, the kinds of things that they are uh, doing and that their, uh, their language moves, so to speak, are supporting each other and um, uh, supporting uh, the instruction. So for that, again, we've done both topic modeling as well as social network analysis. In social network analysis, you're looking at how people are interacting with one another and uh, looking at the connections between those interactions. And we found uh, in that analysis, uh, similar to our previous analysis that there are um, 10 topics that reveal a strong association with algebra one content. And then there are 10 others that have more to do with their social interaction and um, their, uh, uh, in, in essence, just talking with one another. And then the social network analysis revealed the presence of social support among the study experts in the discussions and as well as between uh, the students. So finally, in uh, our uh, fifth study that we've uh, worked on is to better understand the uh, cohesive cues within the math discussion board. So looking at the kinds of language that is being used and looking at it qualitatively as uh, in terms of the language used and also the principal component analysis. And these results have corroborated our prior work on 
on the suggesting that there are strong elements of the math register and discourse, including syntactic complexity, lexical variation, referential cohesion, and information density that are uh, present within these discussion board um, uh, discussion boards and what they're saying and uh, are helping us to better understand the language and as well in the uh, end of year course performance. So we're still working on uh, our end of the project because we, as I mentioned, we started late. We're still, we started analyses looking at the discussion boards before and after COVID. We're looking at the associations between the performance in the discussion board and student activity. And we're also looking at various uh, at assessments of the teacher student tutoring sessions and the classification of the talk moves within those tutoring sessions. Um, and uh, as a future goal, one of the things this has moved us toward is thinking about how we can develop a tutoring um, uh, technologies for the tutors in looking at the different pedagogical communications, communication strategies that the tutors are using and developing a personalized tutoring system that provides instruction and evaluation to, to teacher tutors who are learning how to communicate in these online environments. Uh, and with that, I'll say thank you. Uh, and I'm looking forward to answering questions and having a, a discussion about our project. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Corinne Huggins Manley. I'm from the University of Florida and serving as co PI on the Virtual Learning Lab project. And I'm going to talk about how we developed a system to measure student knowledge, both at scale and in a formative way where we could update it over time. And we used IRT as the main measurement paradigm to achieve this. I'm going to start by talking about the algorithms and then I'll follow up talking about evidence for validity and fairness uh, related to the student scores. But as Walter presented, we have an overall recommendation system and feeding into that needs to be some information about student performance over time. And so that's where the measurement algorithms come into play. What I've put together here is a very simple uh, overview of the flow going through the recommendation system, but only specific to junctures at which we need to measure the students and where that information goes. So we have multiple domains in Algebra Nation. For example, quadratic functions might be a domain. And so as a student enters a domain for the first time in one of our experiments, we would administer a pretest in that domain to get a good idea of how they're doing right now in that particular topic. We also then needed to estimate ability from that pretest, and that ability estimate would be fed into the recommendation system, along with some other information, and then an action is recommended from there. So there we would enter into this cycle, the, this, this flow here, or the cycle that the student would engage in, where the student takes some sort of an action, such as watching a video, and then the student would take what we call a CYU test. <clears throat> it's the mini quizzes that have been mentioned in the prior presentations by my, by my colleagues. And it's specific to the video that they might've just watched and the topic they engaged in. And from their performance on that quiz, we would update their ability. And that updated ability would again be fed into the recommendation system, which would then recommend another action. And that cycle could continue until the student is ready to exit that particular domain and at that time, we would administer a post test so that we could see how they're performing in that domain after going through some recommendations over the video topics. Once the student does that, they can then enter another domain. We then administer another pretest, uh, again, with items chosen based on their ability. So it's an adaptive type pretest. And once again, we would estimate their ability and feed that into the recommendation, and the cycle would continue in that other domain. So in terms of algorithms and research studies of how we uh, made this happen, we have a study that I'll show the citation for in a minute, in a minute from one of our, uh, led by one of our externs, Kang Shu, where we took statewide data on the items in the Algebra Nation system 
And there's a lot of missing data there. So we couldn't directly estimate item parameters, but we used some data mining and machine learning techniques to uh, estimate some unbiased item parameters. And we used the two parameter logistic IRT model. So basically we needed to get unbiased information about the difficulty of each item and also the discrimination of an item. Every time we administered a pretest or a post test, we used an adaptive algorithm to select the items. That allowed us to give shorter versions of those tests. So the pretests were only five items, and then the post tests were 10, as that was a proximal outcome for our experiment. So we wanted those to have a higher reliability, so they're a little longer. But we did select items unique to each student based on whatever updated ability was available at that time, or even a combination of where their ability was at that time. Um, anytime we estimated ability, we used an expected a posterior estimation, uh, otherwise called EEP in our field. Uh, we use, there's a lot of ways to estimate ability in IRT, but we use this because it was, as we were exploring how can we scale this, it was really important that we could estimate ability quickly. And that is actually quite difficult to do, but with this EEP estimation, we were able to get down the estimation time to two seconds or less. And so that allowed for a really seamless interface and, and allowed us to scale this up. But that's really just about the algorithms and, and having them work is one thing and having them work in a short amount of time is really important. But what's really important on top of that is that we have some evidence that these are valid estimates of their ability at that time in that topic. And also some evidence toward the fairness surrounding this entire uh, assessment system. So in order to think about validity evidence, we followed the standards for educational and psychological testing. And there's four, there's actually five, but we're gonna focus on four buckets of types of validity evidence that somebody can gather. And we tried to get multiple pieces of evidence in each of those buckets. So evidence based on test content, thinking about the actual content that the students saw, this is really important. I'm not sure that there's much I could do in terms of getting valid estimates with all my algorithms if the content itself has some issues in it and isn't measuring well the targeted domain. So we had expert teachers for item writing and also expert teacher item reviews in addition to a lot of other uh, item type reviews from a psychometric perspective. And we also had uh, some formal alignment that was completed for in terms of aligning both the item formats and the item content to the state level test in algebra or the EOC. So in, uh, that helped us to ensure that the distal outcome that we were hoping to impact for our students, which is the high stakes graduation test, that we were using similar type of content there. We also wanted to have evidence based on the response processes. So what are students thinking about as they engage? And a lot of this actually aligns with the talk that Sydney just gave. So we leaned somewhat on the fact that we have also an affect measure that was gathering some things about what they're thinking and how they're engaging. So Sydney mentioned uh, briefly that there were some pop-up surveys. We, I would say we use those in our measurement more indirectly in the sense that what we learned by his work there is that there was a lot of variability in how students were engaging or the types of response processes they might be using as they engaged with these tests. But then more directly, we investigated both timestamp information and, and other series of log file data to compare back to the responses and make sense. Uh, we would have some very quick timestamps, also some um, extremely long timestamps that could be flags to us that there was something going on other than uh, the typical amount of engagement we would expect for them to give their full effort in an item. And I'll talk a little bit about some research behind that in a minute with some citations. We also had a lot of evidence based on internal structure. This is really where a lot of the IRT comes in. So we did a wide range of IRT analyses and I will present a, a, a couple of citations from that. We also looked at what we call differential item functioning. Uh, this is when we would, uh, the, the item parameters themselves aren't holding up across different groups or in our case, time periods. So I'll show a citation in a moment for a study in which we really investigated this, uh, what happened when the students uh, went into that COVID environment. Uh, as Walter mentioned in a previous presentation, we found uh, in one of our field studies, we found a treatment effect 
prior to COVID coming into our lives, but then that treatment effect disappeared once the students went home and were in that COVID world. And so we uh, looked at differential item functioning and also the person fit, the, how well our, our models really fit to the different person data across these different uh, landscapes of pre and post COVID education. And that really supplements some of those field test findings that we had there. Finally, we focused a good bit on evidence based on relationships to other variables. Our, our goal was to be measuring how students are doing in a, in a, on fine-grained topics in algebra. Um, and so we needed to ensure that what we found in our ability estimates had some relationship and hopefully a large relationship to other measures of algebra outside of our platform. So we did some uh, research looking at the correlations between our IRT estimates and one of the Florida state tests that the students all took prior to taking their class in algebra. But then we also looked at some partial correlations between item responses themselves and then the actual algebra state level test. Uh, we did that in, in part to select items that actually had this uh, evidence of external validity in the item responses. And so um, having that item selection method and focusing on items that were strongly related to an external measure allowed us to then have higher correlations at this top part between the IRT ability estimates and some outside math scores. So just briefly, I'll walk through a, a couple of the pre uh, publications that we've had related to the work I just discussed. So here we had an extern lead a project thinking about a broad question of fairness in terms of this measurement approach. So as we, uh, one thing we realized was that in our recommender, the measurements themselves affect heavily the exposure to the content that the student will have. And we, we asked uh, through simulation methods, what, what happens um, in terms of variance and content exposure, given the way that we've measured and then recommended things for them? And what does that mean for fairness as they go to take their high stakes exam in algebra? This is the study that I mentioned where we uh, took about a year and a half to calibrate some unbiased item parameter estimates to use in our measurement algorithms. In this study, we were looking more at that response process and, and methods we could use to understand when are students you know, being a little more careless in their test responses and their uh, um, engagement with the tests, using that term loosely, but when, when could we detect that so that our algorithms could appreciate and, and adapt to that situation where the student wasn't quite as engaged um, as we were hoping during the assessments? This is the study that Sydney just mentioned in a prior uh, in his in his presentation, where we actually were asking maybe sometimes students don't have to take this quiz. We know enough about them to know about how they would perform, and that's really important for at scale, I believe, because if we don't really need a student to take a lot of test items, we we should allow them not to all the time. It's important they can practice those things, but my algorithms rely on them taking a lot of test items, and and sometimes we don't need all of that. Is what we found there. We also uh, focused a lot on construct validity early on in our research. So we published a commentary about some of our thoughts on how to align what we were doing to theories of construct um, validity. And then we also thought about how we could uh, use our models to actually calibrate ability when the students have attempted an item multiple times. We have a lot of students that try items again and in our field studies, we weren't able to make use of that for a variety of reasons, but we are engaging in some research, including a, another citation coming up, where we look to see if we can uh, uh, use this multiple attempt on items to understand the student performance. And here, this is in reference to that study uh, where I said we were looking at IRT and differential item function across that pre-COVID and COVID learning environments. And again, that's trying to um, help us to uh, use multiple attempt data as we do this um, moving forward. Thank you very much. Okay, hello everybody. I hope you enjoyed the pre-recorded videos. Mm -hmm. um, we have um, the presenters here and we have a lot of people in, the, in this section. Um, so, um, we we'll just open for questions. Um, you can, um, I assume you can mute, unmute yourself and, or you can put it on the chat. 
I don't know if people can unmute themselves. I'd like to hear someone try. Possible. Okay. Well, okay, I'll go. Can you hear me? <laughs> Hi, Steve, yes. Hi. Uh, I, I wanted to hear more about the pre-COVID, post-COVID kind of change in effect and your kind of speculations or, uh, or data on why you think um, things changed. Yes, uh, so I have more information than that in presentation because we ran uh, two experimental studies, right? And and um, we just finished analyzing the the second one, and we are submitting to to learning at scale. Um, so the so in the first experimental study, we had um, a period where classes were pretty much normal. <laughs> Um, before COVID, and then COVID happened, the school schools closed, and we had that not normal period. And so we did not find, we found a, a significant effect before schools closed that disappeared after after schools closed. Mm -hmm. But then in the next year, we did another experimental study, and we found an effect when classes were happening in mixed mode, like some, some students were in person, some students were online. Um, and so, so given that, my explanation for the effect disappearing when, for the period of schools was, the first period the schools were, were closed, is that instruction was in disarray. You know, there was an adapt, uh, there was a period of uh, getting procedures ready, you know, uh, teachers did not, teachers had their established practice for orchestration of technology in a regular classroom that most of these teachers had been using algebra nation for a very long time. COVID happened without advanced notes. They had to scramble, you know, so, and the students were also scrambling to uh, adapt to online learning. So, and I think like that's the reason where the effect completely disappeared. But then in the next year, where you can say COVID became, you know, the norm of that year, right? The 2021, 2000, the 2020, 2021 year, um, you know, we were able to replicate <laughs> the effects that we had found before schools closed. Um, we actually got even better results because we got the, in the next year, we had both the post-test and we had the algebra one and of a course exam, and we were able to find an effect in both. The effect on the post-test was about this, twice the size of the effect in the algebra one and of course exam, which makes sense, right? The one is a proximal outcome, the other one is a distal outcome, and that's what we are submitting to the Learning and learning at scale conference. So you think it was really sort of almost like a floor effect that just everything fell apart in the early COVID period, and so you don't see that effect, but it came yes. back once once there was adjustment. Yes. Thanks. I'd like to add too that we we did look at the measure some measurement issues from that that year where things were really crazy, spring of 2020. And we did find measurement and variance problems in our tests from after the kids went home and, and were in that disarray. So I think we also had a challenge in even measuring our outcome in a consistent way that year and, and probably some reliability issues in the outcome measure. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, we were fortunate that we we did some good research on what teachers were doing um, during when schools were closed. So, like we ran three teacher surveys, and and and, and those are under review in journals. So, hopefully, you know, we'll be able to, um, you know, have it published on what we found about like how teachers adapted the instruction. Uh, during the, the the onset of the COVID uh, school closures. 
I see um, a hand up from Mary Brownell, right? Hello, how are you, my good friends from Florida? <laughs> um, I have a question um, for Danielle. Uh, I am very interested in this um, language processing you use because I want to think about how to apply it to observations of teachers working with students in classrooms. Um, and so I wanted to ask you more about what kind of discourse moves were you finding to be particularly powerful? I had lots of questions, but I'll start with that one. Uh, thanks. I was hoping your question was for me. I had my fingers crossed. Um, so uh, it, uh, one of the things I've been amazed at is the fact that we can uh, see the discourse moves at all. And that this combination of various approaches to natural language processing, we can see um, the communicative moves in, in contrast to not just that, but the, not, uh, not just the content, but the pedagogical moves. And so you can see the difference between um, when they're using encouragement or uh, praise or simply beginning or starting the conversation with the students, particularly these are usually online environments. So they're a, a little bit more structured in that regard. And we can see that both in the tutoring uh, videos where they are, um, they're relatively scripted, so, but they were also personalized. So it was five tutoring experts and you could see the differences between them and the profile. It was mainly qualitative though, though because it, you know, it's not associated necessarily with outcomes. I wanna say that, but you could uh, see the differences between the, their different approaches and um, the kinds of encouragement they gave one thing that was interesting is that the profiles were associated with like the timing as well within the within the tutor uh, tutoring session and when they would give um, more or less encouragement and more or less um, scaffolding um, and uh, interestingly one of the most popular tutors had more of these kinds of things uh, popular on social media. And then um, you could also see these in the one-on-one -on -one, uh, videos, um, uh, the one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions. Now, one unfortunate uh, effect of COVID on us was that uh, in the year we did our one-on-one -on -one tutoring uh, study, uh, they didn't take the test. So we can't associate those dialogues with performance in their courses. Um, in, uh, you know, it's a good question as to how, the extent to which th the kinds of things we're doing here can be done in a live classroom, which are very different. And I would say that the kinds of things we're doing can be, I wouldn't necessarily expect the same features and this uh, to that. I wouldn't expect to be able to take the same model and then apply it within a classroom. And I think that even classrooms themselves have very different uh, patterns. Nonetheless, I've been kind of amazed at how recognizable the um, topics are and the general patterns like you but it's more qualitative you know I can look at them and go oh yeah that's that's where they're saying that's coming together because they're saying okay good job and those cluster together um, so I'd encourage using the approach um, particularly in online environments and also in maybe just to, in, you know, the problem in, uh, you know, real life uh, situations is the transcription. So transcribing it. One of our questions though, is whether um, 
the automated transcription works well enough. And that's a key question, which would be key to not only this kind of thing where we're online and it's being transcribed and the transcriptions are amazingly accurate. Uh, and so I think it'll work, but also in uh, those kinds of situations in live classrooms. Have you tried it with any of your reading comprehension work? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's kind of where uh, you mean in, uh, oh, do you mean tutoring sessions with reading? Right, and just this using this approach to capturing the language that's being used and... We use it in capturing the language that the students are using. I've never okay. used it in uh, analyzing the teachers okay. or the tutors. But we use it, for example, um, in the tutoring system, um, I start. We uh, give comprehension uh, strategy tutoring. Mm -hmm. And so when the students type in a response, then the natural language processing analysis can uh, essentially there are algorithms that say the extent to which they're using strategies, the extent to which they need to be pushed to do one thing or another, and then they're given more encouragement or they're moved on to different things. And we do the same thing uh, in other kinds of realms like uh, where they're summarizing or writing essays. So we extract those, that, that language using the features um, mostly using the linguistic features and the semantic features. And then we can tell a lot about, depending on the context, a lot about how well the student's doing, how much do they know, what are they feeling? It's just amazing how much you can tell from the language that somebody uses. Thank you, that's really helpful. Okay, I think we hit the time <laughs> and we are supposed to uh wrap up Aaron uh, do you want to do a final remark sure um thanks for a really great session and thanks to all of you for attending I encourage all of you to go to the virtuallearninglab.org website to learn a lot more about this and look for uh all of these folks at upcoming conferences as they dig a little bit deeper into their findings I think this is a really great example of a project that brought together many very interesting partnerships across industry and academia to answer some really important questions about what we can do with large amounts of data and what can we do in online learning platforms, both before the pandemic and in this context of kind of um, while we're in it still, I don't want to say we're post pandemic yet. Um, so, so much to learn here. It's such a rich set of issues uh, to talk through that we could not have done it justice in, in an hour. So again, if you're interested in learning more, please do reach out to everybody here and have a great rest of the meeting. Thanks.